It's time to play ball. Welcome to the podcast with no limits. Whether it be sports, current events, or random thoughts, this is the place to step in and stay a while. Your host is a proud alumnus of Rio Hondo Prep, a former minor league baseball umpire, and a man with strong opinions. Welcome to the Get Home Safe podcast and your host, Matt Hersema. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Get Home Safe. It is Monday, the day after Father's Day here in June. Let's see, June 21st. Yes, June 21st to be exact. Hope everyone had a wonderful Father's Day. I I know we did here at the house. Had my dad over, my brother, uh, Valerie's parents over, and uh, just had had a really good time cooking up some food on the barbecue and uh, maybe consumed a few other uh, refreshments, we'll say. I know uh, it was good seeing everybody and, uh, and hanging out on a, on a Sunday afternoon. Just kind of not really having to worry or think about anything, just uh, enjoying Father's Day. Enjoy what a concept, right? So uh, checking my lighting here and everything for those on YouTube. Uh, I came into the room this morning to record. It is Monday morning. And I said, man, something wrong with the computer because I got this blinking light and this this laptop sure is pretty old as I'm sure anyone who's seen it or, or some of my early recordings with when I didn't have uh, this nice camera you guys could tell so it's time to invest in a new laptop that's for sure if anybody has any suggestions on a good one that is not too pricey I have a few in mind but uh, any, any suggestions are always appreciated so happy Monday, guys. I know not many people listen to the Monday shows as much as, you know, the Bill Barnes weekly Wednesday weigh in. That's a lot of fun. And Bill is, uh, you know, very unique and brings energy. And that's, you know, like, like I mentioned before, all three podcasts, they're kind of three different shows almost. One's just me giving my thoughts, opinions, studs with studs, uh, you know, sports, the sports I like anyway. And then Wednesday with Bill and then Friday, uh, I, 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 I'm able to still do. I got a few more lined up already that I've recorded. Just a long form interview. I love the Friday shows. Great conversation. I think a lot of people enjoy hearing the variety from people. So I had a great guest last Friday in Mike Gashopo, former uh, minor league baseball umpire and currently a San Diego County Sheriff deputy. So we chatted quite a bit on uh, the show Friday. And then this Friday, guys, I got to tell you, those of you who are affiliated with Care Youth League, you're going to love the guest on friday i think uh i don't know if some people have said some people have suggested this person but uh i'm very excited i've already recorded with him Uh, i am going to have on the podcast on friday mr pat taylor who has been a leader at care youth league he's been a missionary he's been a pastor i mean the conversation was great uh so you don't want to miss friday's episode with mr pat taylor patricio as he's known down in san Felipe, Mexico. So a lot of great, great stories he shared with me and uh, just very excited that you guys get a chance to hear, hear from him. And I I was so blessed that he was willing to sit down and record with me through zoom and everything. So uh, that's one blessing of this podcast is being able to, to do those things. And so it was a great catching up with Mr. Pat Taylor, who has done so much for so many uh, kids out there, especially down in Mexico. Well, it is Monday, so we have a Suds with Studs segment that I want to get to here, and, and it's a rather lengthy lengthy article that I want to read. Definitely going to need a few sips of coffee while I do it, uh, but the plan for today, uh, first of all, Bill Barnes is on his way over here today, so I got to kind of knock out this recording before uh, Bill gets here, and um, and it, we have to do our uh, record for our Wednesday show, so it's a busy Monday. It usually is, busy Monday mornings. And uh, off we go, off and running. So I want to do suds with studs. I have a few comments on a few things that occurred over the weekend, the College World Series. You guys know how fired up I am with that about that. Um, I uh, saw some hockey, hockey playoffs, and uh, I saw a little bit of fighting on Saturday night, which uh, which I'll talk about. And then, of course, I'll mention the uh, the U.S. Open. Watched a little bit of that on Sunday while we were uh, gathered and, and having a good time. So a few things to touch on. I'm going to try to keep the show right about an hour so that uh, I can set this aside and hopefully nothing freezes and breaks here with my laptop because it, it's involving the uh, the charging port i think um as far as battery so eh, who knows we'll see anyway it's monday so let's get right into our suds with studs segment 
Now, I am not a sponsor by any means or have a sponsor, but I, I do participate in uh, Black Rifle Coffee, which I'm drinking right now. And Black Rifle Coffee is like a subscription-based coffee service that, you know, they ship you out new bags of coffee every uh, every month if you want or every whatever you want. And it's uh, they, they promote and uh, donate a lot to veterans, you know, military and police. So uh, a great cause, a great company. So, uh, but one of the things I bring it up for this reason, because uh, part of my subscription, I guess I got sent this story. Uh, it's called coffee or die.com. And it was from the black rifle coffee company. I guess they, I don't know, they every now and then will share stories of uh, veterans and things. So I saw the story it came across and I was like, okay, it's a little lengthy, but I think this is perfect for our studs with studs segment. So uh, I am going to read this to you. This was written in May thir- on May 13th in 2019, and it was written by Marty uh, Scovlund Jr. So giving him the credit here, and this was posted on uh, Coffee or Die. Again, I was emailed this story through the uh, Black Rifle Coffee Company, so uh, I encourage you guys to participate in that. If you're looking for a pretty good cup of coffee, they got some good uh, options too. Anyway, uh, that's my, that's uh, my last selling point. Let's read this story here. And uh, I, I was trying to think, I was going through my, my former Suds with Studs uh, list that honorees that we've done. And I don't know that we've had, maybe we've had maybe a group of officers or something, but never specifically, I don't think one woman, one female. And today's story, today's uh, little write-up that I'm going to read you is written about uh, a military a female uh military member of the military so uh her name is shannon kent and uh, i i read the story and i was like man okay we gotta i gotta share this on the the podcast a little long but here we go gonna take more and more sip and then dive right in this is called again written by marty scofland jr in 2019 this is called the legend of chief shannon kent Mumbai wasn't necessarily safe or much as it was stable, or maybe just quiet. For the time being, Kurdish forces backed by the American military successfully drove out the Islamic State in 2016 with a relative calm following. The small northern city of approximately 300,000 would go on to be cited as the model for what Syria would look like post-ISIS, despite being at the crossroads of an international tension between Syria, Turkey, Turkey, Russia, and the United States. Although the radical radical Islamic militants no longer held the city, there was still much work to be done in order to kill or capture the re- remaining cells that threatened the city and region. That work was and is largely being accomplished by a special operations, excuse me, by special operators who have spent the better part of two decades hunting humans and have nearly perfected the craft since the global war on terrorism began in 2001. The main drag in Mumbai was bustling with people on a chilly Wednesday afternoon last January. Shannon Kent, an athletic, red-haired U.S. Navy cryptologist and mother of two, was moving down the street alongside her teammates, Scotty, John, and Gadir. They weren't in uniform. They rarely were in this line of work, but her black North Face hiking pants and dark purple jacket would serve as suitable attire for the day's mission, which was scouting out a location to do a secret meet, among other things. Kent's eyes and friendly demeanor aren't exactly what the average person thinks of when asked to describe a seasoned special operator hunting down ISIS, though, and maybe that's an advantage when assigned to the most secret off off oft-rumored unit in the shadowy Joint Special Operations Command. She was used to working alone or in small teams, almost always clandestinely, clandestinely, (laughs) but sometimes covertly and undercover, and she was a damn, damn good at her job. Ken's team wasn't on a routine patrol that day, as the Department of Defense later claimed, and they weren't out for a leisure lunch at a popular kebab restaurant frequented by americans as many news outlets reported kent was responsible for finding isis cells and their leaders fixing their location in time and space and then providing that intelligence to her peers at delta force and seal team six 
or to pilots who would perform kinetic strikes with GPS guided missiles. Quote, this wasn't the going out to lunch crowd, said her husband, Joe Kent, also a special forces operator, a, a former special operator. Without warning, a blast tore through the nearby restaurant they were passing. Shannon Kent was only a few feet away. Video footage would later show a man with a suicide vest walk into the restaurant moments earlier. Local Kurds evacuated Kent to a nearby hospital where an American helicopter retrieved her. Senior Chief Petty Officer Shannon Kent was killed in action on January 16, 2019, alongside Special Forces Chief Warrant Officer 2, Jonathan R. Farmer, former Navy SEAL Scott A. Wirtz, and Gadar Tahir, an American working as a civilian interpreter. 11 Syrian nationals also died in the attack. ISIS claimed responsibility. Many stories tell a, a tale of the underdog who goes on to accomplish great things against all odds. This isn't that story, and that's not Shannon Kent. Born in Oswego, New York, but raised in Pine Plains by her parents, Stephen and Mary Smith, her youth was spent playing volleyball, running track, and riding horses. In fact, her talent for, her talent for language started on the polo field. She learned Spanish so that she could converse with the stable hands. Mariah Smith, her younger sister, followed her footsteps into equestrian area. Man, big words in this article. Equestrianism with Shannon, often training and acting as her mentor. Since I was five, she was always out riding with me, showing me new things. Kent never lost her passion for horses, and she and Mariah often talked about opening a ranch someday that would offer equestrian therapy for veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder and children with emotional and developmental issues. Smith spoke about how she would have 20,000 goals at the same time and accomplish all of them. She had that drive and tenacity with everything she did. Literally anything she put her mind to, she'd get that done no matter what it was. Indeed, Ken established herself as an overachiever, both academically and athletically in all aspects of life, and it was clear to anyone who met her that she would go on to do great things. She wasn't raised in a family of badasses, Smith continued. Her father was a New York State policeman. I'm sorry, rephrase, man. I'm sorry, I mean, more coffee this morning. I don't know what it is. Okay, quote, she was raised in a family of badasses, Smith Continued, her father was a New York state policeman and would go on to be the third highest ranked officer in the state. And her uncle was a firefighter in New York City. Both were first responders on 9-11, something that propelled Kent towards military service. Her brother is in the U.S. Marine Corps. Her family had a tradition of selfless service. And to say that they were all talented in their respective fields would be a gross understatement. Smith recalled Navy and U.S. Air Force recruiters coming to buy the house as early as Kent's senior year of high school. Kent graduating from Stissing Mountain Junior Senior High in 2001 and gave college a try at her mother's request. To no one's surprise, that didn't last long. By 2003, she was talking to a Navy recruiter about how she could best leverage her talent for language in the service. According to the U.S. Navy, crypto Cryptologic warfare encompasses signal intelligence, SIG, SIGINT for short, the acronym, uh, cyberspace operations and electronic warfare, EW operations, in order to deliver effects through sea, air, land, space, and cyber domains at all levels of war. For some sailors in the career field, that means sitting behind a desk in a room with no windows and no cell phones allowed, decrypting secret communications or translating documents written in a foreign language. Although Kent was perfectly capable of performing that aspect of the job, she found herself in a more hands-on niche. She was techni technically proficient in the tools of the trade, but also spoke seven languages fluently and was tactically capable. Maybe most important, she was seemingly fearless. After joining the Navy in December 2003 and completing approximately two years of training to become Qualified as a cryptologic technician, Kent volunteered as a Navy individual ag agmonte, agmonte, uh, IA to Iraq. Because of her 
specialized skill set, she soon found herself assigned to a special operations task force in Baghdad, working to find high value targets. That wasn't enough, though. According to Joe Kent, quote, she wanted to get her boots on the ground and get her hands dirty. She was tasked out to Baghdad and towards the end of her first deployment, where she worked with a small secretive unit of Iraqi intelligence operatives who, according to Relentless Strike, the Secret History of Joint Special Operations Command by Sean Naylor, worked directly with U.S. special operation operators to go where most Americans wouldn't, to perform human intelligence gatherings, missions, and close target reconnaissance. They were called the Mohawks. The job was dangerous, and those who were caught faced torture, death, and being dumped in the streets. This is where the legend surrounding Kent began. It was 2007, and a very, and very special, very few special operations personnel were willing or able to go speak to Iraqis out in the city in a low visibility capacity. So Kent taught herself human intelligence techniques and already fluent in the language, would go out and develop targets for the task force. Like most of Kent's career, much of her work was with the Mohawks was and is classified, and it likely won't see the light of day for at least 13 more years. But the citation for her Joint Service Commendation Medal received on that deployment notes that she, quote, contributed directly to the capture of hundreds of enemy insurgents and severely degraded enemy combat capability, end of quote. Ali Hassoun, a, a Baghdad native who was working with Iraqi special operators at the time, began hearing other Iraqis talk about an American woman with red hair. Quote, every person I talked to from both Iraqi and American sides was like, have you met Shannon? He said, as her reputation grew, she started going out on raids with American special operators. Having a female on target for a high-level HVT raid was almost unheard of at the time, but she played a pivotal role by conducting on-target interrogations that led to follow-on targets. It's not an understatement to say that JSOC task force is in country at the time was more effective and deadly because of her efforts and her performance directly led to in initiatives that resulted in a broader implementation of females in special operation forces, SOF, for years to come. Unbeknownst to Kent, this is also where she met her future husband, Joe Kent. For the first time, Joe Kent was assigned to 5th Special Forces Group in Baghdad at the time. Quote, she was a woman in SOF before there were women in SOF, Joe Kent said. She became infamous among the Baghdad SOF community. At one point, they crossed paths in Baghdad due to a mutual connection with Iraqi special forces, but it wasn't until 2013 that they discovered each other in a romantic way. By the end of her first Iraq deployment, she had established herself as a competent and fearless intelligence professional, an exceptional linguist, and someone who was value add to any strike force. Shannon Kent, Shannon Kent crashed onto the special operations scene headfirst and didn't slow down once getting in. According to Joey, a special operations intelligence professional who asked that his na last name be withheld, Kent, after returning from her first deployment, was one of the first, if not the first, if not the first female to volunteer for and successfully pass the new Naval Special Warfare Direct Support Course. The course was a month long and involved timed ruck marches, advanced training in close quarter combat, and a variety of other foundational skills that are required to serve alongside Navy SEALs. Joey explained that women in SEAL teams was a new concept at the point at that point, and that she quote set the be benchmark to bring other women into the program. He was there to welcome her to the troops after she was permanently assigned to Navy Special Warfare Support Activity 2 in Norfolk, Virginia, where she worked side by side with East Coast based Navy SEALs. The SEALs were initially hesitant, not just because she was a female, but because no, non SEAL support in general was a new thing during that time. Quote Every day after work, I would see her heading out with a faded New York Yankees hat, brown t shirt, black shorts, and earbuds in to go for a run, Joey recalled, noting that although she had 
She had an alpha personality. She was still quiet and humble. She was just as comfortable as at a drop dropkick Murphy's concert as she was studying in a classroom. It wasn't long before she gained the respect and trust of the seals. Her professionalism and knowledge of tradecraft got her noticed, said Joey. She wasn't afraid to step up. She had that A-type personality. Joey went with her on the next deployment to Iraq in 2009. This time, she was assigned to Baghdad as a member of a special operator, operations task force, where she carved out a niche for herself by fusing, by fusing language, human intelligence, and signal intelligence on the battlefield. She worked in non-traditional roles, according to award citations, making a real impact on the war effort. They capitalized on her ability to get along with anyone in the room, Joey said, adding that she, again, returned to work with the Mohawks. You immediately felt comfortable around her, and she used that to her advantage. Despite the cred credibility she gained on her first appointment, she often found herself starting from square one when she went to a new task force. According to her husband, she often said she was, she wished she could go through a, a beret or tab producing selection course just so that she could have the instant credibility allowing her to forego the prove it period and get right down to business. Nevertheless, she consistently proved it and rose through the Navy's ranks. I am going to skip ahead here a little bit just because this is a rather lengthy article. Um, let's see. It's a good article, though. I encourage you guys, uh, if you'd like to, please check this out because it offers a lot of uh, information on here. And uh, I, I wouldn't mind reading the whole thing, but I know that listening to me, me read something might not be that uh, glamorous anyway. Um, oh, this is an interesting part. Uh, Ali, Ali Hassoun was no longer working in Baghdad. He had immigrated to the U S and joined the U S army uh, as a linguist. He found himself side by side in selection with the famed American redhead, who he had heard about all those years. Quote, she broke a lot of hearts, Hassoun said. She was outperforming men who came from very elite units and in some cases helping them through the sum of the events, which was a real blow to many egos. Hassoun recalled how he was challenged by some of the swimming tests. Quote, she took time to work with me and to make sure that I was prepared. She didn't have to do that. So a very giving person here in, in, in Shannon Ken. It sounds like she she was somebody that was a warrior that was super intelligent and was was really driven to accomplish uh, any goal set before her and to to really uh, break some barriers. It sounds like too some things that not really barriers, but just accomplish things that some women in the military hadn't done before, especially working hand in hand with the Navy with the Navy SEALs. Um, but anyway, uh, I will skip ahead here. I want you guys to read up more on uh, on the Shannon Shannon Kent because a pretty incredible person and unfortunately killed in uh, uh, you know killed by that suicide bomber. Just tra tragic indeed. Uh, mother of mother of two and everything. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna skip to the end here. Please, guys, look up this article. If you want me to send it to you, I will. Um, if you can't find it, but uh, just look up Shannon Kent and. Um, and uh, check it out. So let's see uh, her. It's just, I wanted to read the part about her funeral, which is um, really, really inter interesting and just kind of sad, but uh, anyway, okay, here we go. A thousand sailors, hundreds of other service members, dozens of New York state police officers, and many family and friends filled the pews at Naval Academy's chapel in Annapolis, Maryland, in memory of senior chief petty officer, Shannon Kent. Having her memorial service at the Academy Chapel was a big deal. She is the first enlisted sailor in U.S. Navy history to be allowed the honor. In fact, the last person to have their memorial there was late Senator John McCain. Only a Navy chief, only a chief may wear the Navy's khaki uniform. For Kent, it was a sea of khaki, just what she would have wanted. Many of her teammates, most of whom will remain nameless due to the sensitive nature of their work, bravely stood up to speak to the massive crowd, hoping to shed light on the kind of person Kent was. Her senior, sailor, her senior leaders spoke of her prowess as an intelligence professional and praised her leadership as a chief. For the CT community, we do, uh, we do, uh, 
we do not often think of ourselves as a frontline force. We are the nerds who toil away diligently to enable a fight, one sailor said while speaking at the podium. We would not be here today if that was if this was true. Through tears, the sailor continued sharing how Kent told him that he gave his daughter what every little girl wants for her birthday, a father to be proud of. Okay, that's pretty much it here for her, uh, the, the uh, end of the article. But um, yeah, I'll stop right there. Just anyway, uh, for you guys, if you guys kind of get the idea and, you know, I blanked, I told it was, I was going to try to read the whole thing, but it's just, it's so long and it's, you know, it's, it's very uh, fitting though. Uh, she definitely deserves this accolade, this praise. Uh, Shannon Kent, someone who did a lot of things in the military that no woman had done before, someone who was brilliant, uh, special operations, all of these uh, covert missions, can't even talk about them, who knows how many lives she saved with uh, some of her actions over the years in intelligence and finding bad guys who want to do bad things, right? So uh, to Shannon Kent, who's been uh, gone a few years now since, uh, 2000, let's see, 2019, I believe, in January, um, you know, uh, thank you so much for your service. And uh, you are definitely someone I would love to sit down and have a beer with, not just by the first round, but every single round. And one of many more people we want to continue to talk about on uh, Mondays here in our on our Suds with Studs segment here at the Get Home Safe podcast. So uh, guys, go read that article. And if not that article, uh, look up uh, Shannon Kent because a remarkable, remarkable person. And so uh, as always, I'm always looking for, for people to t chat about on the podcast regarding uh, Suds with Studs. And so, uh, yeah, definitely uh, give that a look, if you will. Anyway, let's move on back to uh, more of the podcast here. Sports topics, sports topics. I, I mentioned yesterday uh, or that I was watching yesterday on Sunday, uh, the U.S. Open down in Torrey Pines, San Diego area. Uh, looked like a pretty nice day, maybe not too warm. Um, I was surprised that, you know, usually the U.S. Open, pretty, uh, really tough, tough course. And uh, I was surprised to see uh, the, the leading scores were actually uh, up there in the, you know, minus five, minus six, six under, five under, because usually it's, it's even close to par, I think, to my knowledge, with most U.S. Opens, because it's usually a really tough course. So, um Anyway, John Ram won the uh, U.S. Open by one stroke, shot a six under. He actually had quite a day on Sunday, uh, the final round, just uh, you know, put up put up really good numbers, and uh, kind of finished before Rory McIlroy and and kind of the guys that were kind of in the in the hunt, and um, he was kind of waiting around, like he started to get loose as Rory got uh, what was it on eighteen, I think, but uh, the I think. Anyway, whatever ended up happening, he lost by a, uh, won by a stroke. It's kind of weird. Usually, the guy wins. Is it waiting around? He's usually one of the guys among the last group there, and um, he he held off. Uh, he held off a guy from set who was chasing him. But uh, anyway, his Rams first first. Uh, what am I trying to say, man? I'm sorry. It's a rough morning, guys. I don't know what the issue is here. Uh, the, uh, first major, geez, there it is. Uh, first major, um, uh, John Ram from, uh, Spain. It was a really cool sight to see, uh, his wife, uh, Kelly, uh, Kelly there on the, uh, course with him afterwards with his newborn son. What a special father's day. Pretty awesome to see indeed. Uh, anytime you see a first time champion, uh, who's also a first time father that had to be just one one a uh, memory you can't recreate ever so uh congrats to john ram uh he became the first spanish golfer to win the u.s open so congrats to him uh and just really cool to see golf you know back it, it really didn't go away i should i will say but i don't know all these sports that have just continued to to uh be present and to 
be normal, be regular. It's so refreshing to see after all the other weird things that we saw. And again, the one thing I'll say about golf is you, you don't really see any activism or anything like that. It's like, let's just go play. And uh, it, it makes, it makes me want to get out there and play when I see good golf, because uh, it reminds me, well, I learned real quick that no, I, uh, I'm nowhere near these guys. Uh, but anyway, uh, fun to watch, always fun to watch the majors, but congrats to John Ram on winning the, uh, the U S open on Sunday. Okay. Major league baseball is, uh, I don't, I don't know what the issue is here with this whole foreign substance issue, like why it's such a point of emphasis, but it, it must be for a reason. So there must be some serious problems out there. I don't think it's a big conspiracy just so that it's more offense or anything. It's just the way the game is played these days. It is this all or nothing it's home runs and strikeouts. And that's all you see. It seems like, so maybe they're trying to make pitchers less successful. I don't know. Pitchers have always kind of bent the rules a little bit. And, and, you know, if you know, if you're not cheating, you're not trying, you know, is the old saying, I mean, there's, it's funny how in cheating in bending the rules, there's, there's like acceptable cheating, you know, obviously what the Astros did was I think cross the line. It's, it's like, a, it's an unwritten, like what exactly is acceptable? What exactly isn't, you know, using vi video to then uh, bang a trash can to tell a hitter what's coming. That's a bit much for me, but a pitcher, maybe, uh, you know, having a little, little something, not a lot of something, but a little something sunscreen. I don't know. It's like, oh, maybe that's all right. As long as you don't get caught, but I don't know. I think it's funny that like, for instance, I, I played sports in high school and I was, you know, aggressive, we'll say in certain areas. And maybe, maybe that was bending the rules technically, you know, trying to do, do things that I could get away with that, um, as long as I didn't get caught, but I also knew that if I got caught, I was going to be, you know, called for a foul or, or whatever the case was, but, um, it's an interesting subject. And I'm talking about like, even from a, uh, an aspect of like religious, uh, religious guys, you know, I've seen some very, very good people get involved in competition. And it's interesting how, <laughs> what they're willing to do, what they think is okay, you know, in, in sports, but that's what sports does for us. I think it, it, it opens us up. Competition brings out the best and the worst in people. I've always said that. So this baseball situation Apparently they, they're going to instruct umpires to go out and uh, check, check uh, pitchers, which they've, they've done before. And, you know, but it had to be for a reason. Like there had to be someone in the clubhouse who spoke up and said something. So, but now it's like almost mandated, like go out there. We won't, we don't want pitchers to have anything. Uh, mostly it's pine tar, right? Pine tar that hitters get to use with bats and everything. But as far as delivering the baseball, I think, uh, a lot of pitchers will say that it's just to grip the ball. It's not to put any kind of extra spin on it. But the problem is when you allow something, you tolerate some type of substance like that. Uh, it's just a slippery slope type of a thing. So I'm curious how this plays out. Apparently it's starting this week today, Monday, where umpires are going to go out and really police this. And they do not want pitchers with any kind of, uh, with any kind of substance, uh, foreign substance, of course, there are, there are legal substances and things, but uh, it's going to be interesting. So keep your eyes peeled. I think there's going to be some problems. I do. I think umpires are going to look like the bad guys, of course, like always, but they're just doing what they're told. And everyone's been warned. Everyone knows what they can and cannot do. So uh, we'll see here upcoming. Um, you know, something I, always, I told you guys this about like the NFL before, but I like, I like drafts. I don't know why it's, it's like the blending of the college and the professional ranks. Uh, and a few years ago, I started to watch close, more closely, the MLB draft, not every round. Cause there's a ton of rounds, but usually the first round, cause it's, it's, it's cool to see guys in college that you, and to see how quickly they get to the major, major leagues, because unlike other sports, where you get drafted and you're, you know, on that roster right away, guys spend a few years in the minor leagues. Some guys it's really quick a year, other guys, uh, they, it takes a few years to get up there. So that's always interesting to me specifically because the draft usually in past years was before the college world series. 
So the draft would happen and then guys would be playing in the college world series. And they'd, they'd say, Oh yeah, this guy was drafted uh, 12th overall by the tigers. And, you know, it was just, you, you kind of knew as you're watching these guys in the world's college world series, where they were going to be playing eventually, which you don't experience in football and basketball. So I always thought it was cool, but I do like that the draft now is after the college world series, because I think it, I don't know, it clears up distractions maybe. And just, uh, it, it keeps that mystery of where guys are going to go. And so anyway, the draft is coming up here in, in July, July 11th through 13th, a three day event, um, almost a month after it usually is or a month and a half even. So um, you get to watch the college world series without any uh, big distractions or, or knowing where guys are going uh, anyway to the college world series. It opened on Saturday and you know, I love me, me some uh, college world series, Omaha, Nebraska, uh, TD Ameritrade park. I got to go in 2008 to Rosenblatt, uh, the old stadium up there on the Hill that is no longer, but uh, great experience. Me and Todd Carson, that was a blast. But anyway, College World Series started on Saturday, and first game of the day was NC State and Stanford. And what's interesting, even about like blowouts in the post, well, the College World Series will say, like Stanford really got punched in the mouth here by the North Carolina State. They uh, they took it to them. But even blowouts aren't like that bad of scores. It was ten to four final. Uh, NC State really uh, took it to them, scored early and often. Stanford came in with kind of this heavy, heavy hitting offense and only put up four runs. So uh, they are going to face elimination today, Monday, actually, uh, in the first elimination game in the College World Series. And they're going to be facing Arizona, their Pac-12 rivals. Uh, Arizona, I got home Saturday night and was watching some of the Arizona Vanderbilt game. Great game back and forth. Uh, Arizona had a, a three run lead at one point, And then Vanderbilt came back. Arizona tied it in the ninth. And then in the 12th inning, it was Jason. Um, what is his last name? Jason, not Rodriguez. I'm sorry. I should have known all this. I'm um, brutal, brutal, brutal. Anyway, local kid from uh, Bishop Amat High School, actually, who uh, uh, Jason Gonzalez. I'm sorry. Uh, Bishop Amat High School. I've actually umpired a few of his games in his youth, youth sports and everything, youth baseball, but uh, he had a game winning single with the bases loaded. There was one out and there was a tie game, bottom 12. I would have, I thought, especially with uh, Jason Gonzalez, who's a power hitting guy and hit a home run in this game as well. I thought the infield should have played back, play back, turn a double play. You're out of the inning. You play up, then you got to try to get out two hitters. Plus a, a ground ball single can sneak through. And I know it's tough to turn a double play at times, but I thought that would have been the better way to play it. Arizona had previously gotten out of the inning and a bases loaded one out situation as well uh, in the 11th, I think, but uh, Gonzalez hit one through up the middle that probably would have been a double play ball had they been back, but it got through. He was the hero. Vanderbilt won the game seven to six walk off win on day one of the college world series. So Arizona Stanford will play each other uh, Monday first game. And for, for those on the West coast game times are kind of weird uh, because these games are played in Omaha, Nebraska. So locally for us, West coasters, Games are at 11 and four. So kind of it's one and six locally out there. So that's, it's kind of an odd time, but uh, the morning games to, uh, Monday and Tuesday are elimination games, 11 AM uh, games, the, the battles of the, uh, the two teams that lost their first game in Omaha. So Arizona versus uh, no, Stanford on Monday at 11 o'clock, the winner's bracket game, NC state against Vanderbilt. Those are the two one and O games. Uh, whoever wins that, will be two and oh and sitting in the driver's seat. If you lose, you lose that game. You have to win uh, three in a row basically to get to the final, the to, to stay alive and get to the, the championship series and the two teams, Arizona, Stanford, you know, they lost. If they want to get to the championship series, now they have to win four games in a row. They got to win Monday. They got to win Wednesday. Then they got to win uh, Friday and Saturday. So that's the schedule. That's kind of what's uh, what they're going up against. But anyway, Sunday, Father's Day turned on the game and was watching Virginia and Tennessee. It was the Cavaliers who shut out the Volunteers six to nothing. Uh, some cool stories with that Virginia team, Virginia offense. I think the Virginia catcher, his dad was like a cancer survivor, was in the stands and he, he hit a home run. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, Virginia, the ACC tops the SEC six nothing in the first game on Sunday. In the, and then in the, uh, the evening game, Sunday night, Mississippi State two, Texas one. 
So the SEC gets a win over the Big 12. Good baseball game, just kind of back and forth. Mississippi State, State led 2 nothing most of the game. Texas tried to rally late but couldn't do it, so they are in the loser's bracket. So that takes us to the schedule for Tuesday. It'll be Tennessee and Texas in the loser's bracket. One of those teams will go home 0-2. And in the winner's bracket game, Mississippi State against Virginia in the evening. So College World Series, man, it's uh, it, a lot of great things to watch here. Two games Monday, two games Tuesday, one game Wednesday, one game Thursday, and then they'll back to two games Friday, two games, or maybe two games on Saturday, depending on who wins and this and that. So that's the schedule coming up. And then next week at this time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, will be the final three game series. Once the, the two, the two winners who come out of the, the uh, two 14 brackets, whoever comes out of those uh, they will face off in a three game championship series starting Monday, Monday, Tuesday, if necessary on Wednesday. So that's the schedule for Omaha. Very, very much looking forward to this. I can't wait. Uh, I'm going to try to watch some of it before I head off to work and also try to try to um, try to uh, record and, and watch late as well. So I'm excited about Omaha. Not really, except Arizona Stanford, a little West Coast flair, but one of them is going to be eliminated already. So uh, I don't know who, who you watch, who you root for, whoever you, you like. You're going to see good baseball. You're going to see some, some good stuff here in the College World Series. So be sure to stay tuned uh, for more talk about that next week. By next Monday, by next Monday's show, we'll know who the championship teams are in the three-game series. All right. Uh, and you're going to see a lot of good baseball. I mean, if that's not all home runs and strikeouts, there's some good stuff at the college world series. So if you have, if you've never checked it out before, give it a watch 11 o'clock and four o'clock, most days, uh, just four o'clock on Wednesdays and Thursday. Um, that one thing the college world series is doing, they're doing this ump cam where you have the, the, the video on the umpire's mask or camera on their mask. And it, it looks, I, I can't imagine what it's like to have that on your mask. It's got to be heavy on your neck and everything. But one thing they're offering is that if you really, really want to, I don't know why you would want to do this an entire game, but you can, with the ESPN app or whatever, you can watch an entire game on ump cam. So you can see what an entire game is like all three hours uh, with the umpire's mask on, what it's like looking out at seeing a pitch come. So those of you who think you could, umpire and don't want to put the gear on but want to see what it's like behind the plate uh there's your chance and you can watch a few a few pitches and see if it's for you because it's not easy it, you know, on tv that center field camera it's like oh you can call pitches all day right but go back there see the hitter's hands kind of getting in your way at times the catcher where he sets up and the, that little dance maneuver you have to do you can get a feel for it you can't feel the heat or the sweat out there but but if you watch uh, the game on the ump cam I think it'll give you guys a, an appreciation, we'll say, for umpiring out there. It's not anything new. It's been around a while, but it, it is something I think that it, that is is cool. Every now and then they show, you know, what it's like back there. And instead, I can't, I couldn't watch a whole game that way. I'd get, I'd get bored. But uh, I, I plus I did it plenty of times. Um, okay, something that I saw this week, I was blown away by, and I gotta thank Nick Gonzalez, a loyal listener here, Real Hondo Prep grad, for offering uh, telling me about this this is on showtime and you can probably find it other places but it was called the kings four-part series documentary an hour each roughly and it was about uh the golden era in boxing really and it was about four specific guys the kings right the kings of boxing uh sugar ray leonard roberto duran marvin Hagler, and tommy hearns and how they all fought against each other. You know, it was a time where like right now we're in this, this age where the best fighters don't fight each other all the time. It's weird. It's like make these fights happen. I don't know what's so difficult, but it went inside each of the uh, backgrounds of each of the fighters set, to, you know, talked about things that us normal folk don't know really about their background and, and their upbringing and everything. And it was really, really cool. It was really well done. Thank you, Nick Gonzalez. He knew I'd like it, and I absolutely loved it. I, went, I blew through it really quick. Some some um, emotional moments as well. Um, you know, we we did just just lose a, a month or so ago, Marvin Marvin Hagler, marvelous Marvin. So uh, and and I'm not sure. I haven't looked up the other guys, the other three fighters, if, if they're still uh, still around. But uh, really cool stuff. And you it, it got me fired up for some boxing. And even if you're not a boxing fan, a fight fan. 
dude, they, it was incredible. Like the, the backstories and to see the challenges and, and how, uh, like people thought Sugar Ray Leonard had it easy and Marvin Hagler had to struggle and get through, you know, to finally get some, uh, some notoriety and respect. Like it was, there's all kinds of stories like Roberto Duran fighting for Panama, the entire country, just, uh, every, every uh, move he made, what a big deal that was, you know? So, I I'd highly recommend this. Uh, it's in the, it's set in the uh, the eighties. Right. So it talks, uh, there's a lot of talk in uh, things about Reagan being president too, and what that was all like. And back then, you know, it was uh 15 rounds in championship fights, not 12 rounds like it is today. So 15, three minute rounds. Uh, they stopped doing that in 88, I believe where they went to 12, but some of these fights, man, I, it's only three more rounds, but still, uh, 15 times so at three minutes. So 45 minutes of a uh, warfare versus 36. Um, that was a big deal. I mean, it was the survival of the fittest. And a lot of times uh, there were some late stoppages that you guys will see in the documentary and everything, but just really, really cool uh, to see uh, this documentary and learn. I love learning too. I like stories, but I like learning about guys and how things were kind of at a time that where I was born, I'm born in the eighties. So it's kind of cool to look back on a, Stuff like that when uh, what was going on exactly? Uh, let me see. Oh, and that's something about boxing and fighting too that I that I like in UFC is the whole concept of when when a fight when a winner is announced, uh, if it's the the champion versus the challenger, uh, you don't even have to finish the name their name and you know who won. Here's the scorecards and the winner, uh, the the the, the uh, fight tonight is uh, and new or and still. And so, and new champion and still the champion. That's like this, uh, this should be, I'm sure there's shirts or something made, but, but, and new and still are, are two of the phrases, uh, fighters use like, Hey, I'm going to get my hand raised and it'll be, and it'll be, and still it'll, it'll be, and still on Saturday night and, uh, you know, challengers. Now it's going to be, and new and new on Saturday night after it's all said and done, it'll be, and new and new champion. So anyway, uh, random again, random stuff. I, I spew into this microphone guys. So, uh, that's just, uh, that's just me being random. Uh, Car Adam Carolla interviewed, uh, George St. Pierre. I posted it on Facebook. Uh, credible interview. Even if you're not a fighter, I am a, I'm not a fight fan. Uh, I, I like the fight of UFC and boxing stories, but I think regardless of what it is of who they are, these are great interviews and great stories and documentaries that I think anybody can appreciate. So the George St. Pierre, inter Pierre interview, I posted it on Facebook, but it was last week, I think uh, his Wednesday or Thursday show. And it's uh, the second part. So it's like, it, it, you should be able to find it. Just look up Adam Carolla and George St. Pierre. Uh, I didn't know much about uh, St. Pierre and, and he's from my, my grandmother's uh, region of uh, Canada. So I found that that interesting to, uh, to know and just hear him speak and to hear that, you know, he was bullied as a kid and that was a big reason he went into fighting. And it was just, you guys got to check it out. Check it out. The Adam Curl interview, George St. Pierre of uh, the UFC legend and a guy that had only, I think lost twice in his entire career, which is crazy for, uh, for UFC uh, and new and still, uh, I heard from uh, someone, you know, you hear from some, some people on the podcast that uh, you just, man, you're blown away. You're like, man, I, I, cause I don't know who's listening out there. Right. All the time. I know the loyal listeners and I know, that uh, there's at least, you know, 40, 50 people, whatever, who usually on average listen to the, the podcast. But I heard from a, a, a guy who, who I hadn't really talked to before, but I knew his name and I, and I had, uh, you know, he played alongside a lot of uh, great guys at Real Hondo Prep, but it was uh, Rod Bazuzzi reaching out and saying hello, saying, hey, I enjoy your podcast, keep up the great work. That was cool to hear. It was cool to hear uh, someone like Rod who had uh, played ball at RHP and has gone on and done uh, plenty of great things. And so to hear, uh, I don't know, to hear from people is, is uh, it's a blessing guys. It's, it really is fun to know that for some reason people are tuning in and listening or watching the get home safe podcast. So uh, it's, it's awesome to hear from you guys. And I always say it, but I love hearing from you guys just, uh, just like you hear from us. So uh, be sure to, uh, if, if you ever want to say hello, by all means, uh, do so. It doesn't have to be a question or anything like that, but uh, greatly appreciate you guys uh, who do reach out on a on a weekly basis. I asked you guys last week about walk up songs. What would your walk up song be? You know, what would be a uh, or 
not not even a walk up as like a hitter, but even a fighter coming out of the tunnel, right, approaching the ring. I asked for some, uh, I asked for some walk up songs. Like, what would be yours? And I did get a few responses from some from some people, which uh, I'll tell you about right now. Okay, I heard from, of course, my good friend Maynard Bajorquez, uh, who's a West Point grad and writes in to, to Bill Barnes quite often, actually, to get his comments on things. Uh, he said, uh, he wrote in and he said, well, he, did he give me two? Yeah, he gave me two, actually. He gave me one from POD called Boom, which I'm sure most of you guys have, have heard that song before, whether you either you know it or not. He said, this would be my intro song. He said, at, at 48 seconds specifically, so 48 seconds into the song uh, is when he would uh, like it to uh, to be uh, like like his walk up to be. A matter of fact, I can actually let's see. Can I? Let's see. Yeah, if you guys have heard this one before. So that one there. Good song, really good song. You know what this re song reminds me of, Manor? This song, unfortunately, when we went up to. Uh, two years in a row, we played our basketball playoff game. Both years, both in the quarterfinals, and we lost both games. Uh, we played at Desert Chapel in the uh, first year. My junior year was a triple overtime thriller. We should have won. We blew a 14-point lead or something. But uh, they played so much POD in the gym before the game and just blasted it. And every time I heard that music afterwards, I was like, get down. I'd think about that game. And then we lost the next year. We went back up there and lost again uh, in the, in the playoffs, but that gym was so loud, so small. And P they blasted like the entire POD um, uh, album. I think that year. And, and that was one of the songs uh, was boom. And it's a good one. It gets you going. That's for sure. So uh, he also uh, Maynard said, here's like another classic walk-up song, John Lee hooker. Going back a little bit, John Lee Hooker called the uh, Boom Boom. That's an ad. Come on now. I feel like Bill Barnes here trying to do this. Oh, let's see. John Lee Hooker. Oh, yeah. Good one, Maynard. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Gonna shoot your head down. Now batting for real Hondo Prep. Right fielder. Maynard Bajorquez. Yeah, I dig it. I dig it. John Lee Hooker's good stuff, man. Can't go wrong there. Uh, good suggestions there, there, Maynard. Uh, thank you so much for writing in to the Get Home Safe podcast. Uh, I got a few other listens. Uh, Todd Carson, he uh, he told me, and I'd forgotten about this song, and he uh, sent me just just the 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 title and the artist. And I, as soon as I saw it, I went, oh, yeah. I think we had heard this at a baseball game or some some college baseball player probably had it. But it was uh, Answer answer to No One by Colt Ford. And I actually played it or posted it on the uh, Facebook page, Get Home Safe Podcast Facebook page. And uh, I had forgotten about that song, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, like country hip-hop, really. Uh, so maybe not your style, but definitely my style and some great intro too with the, with the guitar. Anyway, I thought that was good. Now batting through a hundred prep. Todd play. Catcher, what position were you Todd? Now batting through a hundred prep, Todd Carson. Good song. Good song. I like it. I love it. I played it a few times actually over the weekend, just kind of head bobbing and getting going. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. Super, you know, very conservative country family values, all those things. Yeah, how terrible they are, but a great song. Great song uh, that I that I enjoyed anyway. And then I heard from Edwin Ixta. I hadn't heard from Ed Edwin in a while. He gave a, a couple songs, suggestions here. And he was funny. He said in there, um, in the text specifically, and, and this was, I mentioned this when I told you guys about walk-up songs was that it doesn't have to be the entire song. It can be something that is uh, a, ver a, a portion of it or even an instrumental part. And so Edwin wrote in, uh, he said, uh, let's see, 
I wanted to share you my walk-up songs. They're instrumental because the lyrics are terrible, but here they are. <laughs> so I I hear you there, Edwin. Uh, so he played some instrument. Pharaoh Monch, Simon Says, the instrumental version. Yeah, I, I think we've all heard this song before. Somewhere. Now batting. For real Hondo Prep. Edwin Ixta. Dun, 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 dun. I like that. Nice call. Nice call, Edwin. Yeah, I, I think the uh, the lyrics are a little deplorable, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, and then the other song, that's an advertisement. Again, brutal. The, and then the last song, I'll, I'll so I'll, won't keep you guys going here, but this is uh, excellent. What's the difference by Dr. Dre? And of course, instrumental. And I really like this one because it has that like, it's old school, uh, it's old school rap, I, I think, or has that kind of like the beat and the little, the beat is a, uh, is pretty, pretty cool. You can't go wrong. It's got like this uh, old school beat to it, but also it's like, I don't know. It means business, right? You mean business. So I could, I could definitely see this one being, being a good one too. What's the difference instrumental, of course, from Dr. Dre. Now batting for real Hondo prep. From the class of 2006, Ooh, wow. Edwin Ixta. I like it, Edwin. Thanks, guys. Thanks for writing in with your uh, walk-up music. What your what your song would be if you came out of the tunnel as a fighter, or as uh, maybe going to home plate as a as a hitter in baseball. Thank you for those. Uh, really, really cool to get some participation out there from my, uh, my questions to the audience out there. It helps me on Mondays when I don't have to, uh, you know, read a long article or pretend to know anything about uh, golf or other things. <laughs> anyway, No, it, it's always fun. It's like I said, it's been a tough morning here. I definitely need more coffee and Bill Barnes should be here uh, any minute now. I just hope this computer can, uh, can hold off. Let me see what else. Um, oh, a hockey playoffs. I talked on Sunday night. It was funny how after things kept ending, I watched the U S open that ended. Then I turned the college world series on that ended. And it was like, I had this plethora of, of, uh, of sports and, and great talk, great, uh, uh, great events going on. I was like, I was li living large. I was loving it. And we had some good barbecue and things too, but the, the hockey playoffs, as I mentioned, always exciting um, on Sunday night. It was Las Vegas and Montreal who played uh, into overtime and a good, good, good game. Uh, Vegas was down two to one and uh, they ended up winning on a goal there in overtime on Sunday night. I was watching live and uh, you know, it's tough for me because Las Vegas as a Kings fan, I can't really root for them or can I, they're West coast. Eh, maybe, I don't know. And that, uh, because I do love Vegas. I like Las Vegas and, and uh, you know, wouldn't mind moving there someday, uh, at, at least in Nevada. And then Montreal, you know, I talked about my, my grandmother on my mom's side uh, who I never met, but uh, that's where she was from. So I, I have New York ties, right. With my mom's side of the family and then specifically her mom up in Montreal. So I always kind of watch the New York teams a little closer than uh, I still love my California, my West coast, you know, West coast bias out here. But uh, I don't know. I always try to find reason to show interest or, why you know not a reason to root for the team for a team exactly but uh, that's just kind of how i operate in regarding sports but uh, vegas won the game two to one uh in overtime to tie the series two to two so remember the winner of this game uh or this series i should say is going to go to the stanley cup finals so they're going to game five that will be played on tuesday uh tuesday thursday saturday their next three games, potentially game five, six, and seven, if necessary. So a really good series there. Uh, another good series uh, also between Tampa Bay and the New York Islanders. That series is also tied two to two. So uh, they split the first two games and then split the next two games. Uh, it was the Islanders who won on what day was that? Saturday the 19th. They won on Saturday the 19th to even up the series. So, uh, again, great playoff hockey upcoming this week. Uh, enjoy it while it's here because it's going to go away rather quickly. Uh, games five, six, and seven for the Islanders and lightning game five tonight, game six, Wednesday and game, uh, game seven 
if necessary on Friday, the 25th. So you got playoff hockey every day of the week this week and the college world series. What are we going to do is, are there enough TVs uh, handy? I mean, you, you can't beat it, man. You just cannot beat uh, some of the options we got right now. Remember Stanley cup playoffs were great last year. They were in the bubble, but uh, they were, they were uh, at a different time. They were in the summer, which was weird. We didn't even have the college world series last year. They just canceled it all together. So, um, so uh, yeah, just be sure to enjoy this while it's here, because before you know it, it'll be, uh, it'll be July. And I was talking to Sam, my brother, you know, June's a pretty good month. You know, if you're into the NBA, the NBA playoffs are going to, and, 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 you know, some, some good series matchups, I believe there. Uh, and, and as predicted, Laker fans continue to, to drive me crazy with their, like, such poor sports. Talking, oh, the Clippers, they're, yeah, they're, good, good luck, Clippers, uh, son. Yeah, no, we'll go win another champ. Go out. We, we, we this, we that. We've won 17. You've gotten that. It's like, you're not in the playoffs anymore. You're done. Yes, you've got a great history. Congratulations. Why even play the games anymore if it's just based off of uh, who has the most championships? That's not what the you play the playoffs over. Anyway. Bitter poor sports, I think. Laker fans kind of having a bad, uh, a bad attitude. But hey, that's uh, you know who you know who has a really bad attitude and is one of the worst guys in Major League Baseball is Joey Votto. He got ejected again over the weekend, lost his mind, and every time he loses his mind, he has to be re- restrained and it looks like he's going to kill somebody. Uh, the announcers, I don't know if it's the same ones or not, but are always like, "This is the most emotion I've ever seen Joey Votto. He he hardly ever acts like this. Really, hardly ever acts like this." Go, go look up Joey Votto ejections and, and see how calm and cool and collected and what a nice guy that he is. Guy loses his mind. Just always, always a problem. Anyway, uh, I, I just, I saw, I saw that and I had to mention it to everybody. Uh, but anyway, what was I saying? Uh, uh, oh, yeah. So yeah, if you like the NBA and you want, you know, there's still some playoffs there, the hockey playoffs in June. I like the college world series. We had the U S open June's a pretty good month. June really is a pretty good month. And then uh, July, there's really not, there's the, what the major league all-star game in the summer. That's one day. Um, August is they, they truly are the dog days. It's a long part of the, the baseball season. The, uh, the, the long 162 game season that is just uh, brutal for baseball fans out there. And, you know, if, if you're if your team is out of it, it's just tough, <laughs> tough play knowing you got another, I don't know, uh, 70 games left or whatever. So, uh, the dog days are tough and, and kind of, we are, we slow down sports wise. I'm sure on the podcast, it'll slow down here a little bit too. Cause man, man, to get, uh, to get through the summer, we are just trying to get to September, right? Get to that Labor Day weekend when college football starts. And then the NFL after that. Uh, but I, I really felt that box and as I've said before, boxing and UFC, I don't Saturday was a crowded night of fighting. It was, uh, they tried to like go up against each other. I'm like, man, you guys really need to exchange days, man. Somebody fight on Sundays, will you? Sundays are open. And in July and August, I mean, all there really will be is major league baseball. So I hope the, the, the fight cards, there's already some good ones scheduled, but I really hope that they take advantage and put these events in uh, windows where people can watch multiple fights, not just one card on UFC and a boxing, like spread them out, spread them out, man. And somebody somewhere do, do some Sunday afternoon, middle of the day fights. I think it would be great. I really do. I think it'd be perfect. But what do I know? I'm just a rookie podcaster rambling away on a Monday, not able to read, uh, can't get enough coffee. It seems like, I don't know. Anyway, enough for me today, guys. I appreciate you guys tuning in to the get home safe podcast today. I need a new computer. Um, John Ram won the U S open college world series is, uh, off and running two great hockey series left in, uh, the Stanley cup semifinals and, uh, great, great big week ahead. Pat Taylor on the show on Friday. You don't want to miss this, whether you're a, a carry youth league alum or not, uh, great conversations with an incredible person, just one of the best people, uh, walking on the planet, someone who's given his life to uh, to uh, the children of, of God and just being someone that has sacrificed so much to uh, spread the word of God in, in, in this country and Mexico. So a great conversation with him. I'm about to record with Bill Barnes 
for our Wednesday show. So a busy, busy day and a week ahead for us here on the Get Home Safe podcast. I have another recording set up for the following week for a Friday uh, interview. But after that, I'm looking for suggestions or people who want to step forward and say, hey, let, let's. Uh, what about this person? So if you have any, please let me know. Guys, it has been a blast chatting with you. I know I was a little uh, lengthy on the Suds with Studs uh, segment. I encourage you, please go read up on um, on uh, on uh, Kent um, because uh, what an incredible person uh, she was. Uh, I am so sorry. I'm all over the place right now. As I finish up the... Uh, as I finish up the podcast here, I'm just like, man, I got too many things on my mind. That's what I have is I, is I lay in bed at night uh, thinking of ideas and I don't always put them forth and it's, or, you know, make them happen. And so I, uh, I do apologize, but anyway, go look up Shannon Kent, credible story, and also enjoy the week of sports that we have and enjoy the month here uh, of sports. Cause we got some great big things ahead and hopefully I can get my act together, get a new laptop and uh, continue to put out episodes in a timely manner. Guys, have a great week. Hope you will join us on Wednesday with Bill Barnes and the weekly Wednesday weigh-in. He and I have a lot of things to get to. And uh, last week's show, we, we kind of went off a little bit. I think we'll be uh, pretty aggressive and exciting this week as well. And then Friday, don't miss our interview with Mr. Pat Taylor, uh, a lifelong contributor to Care Youth League. And uh, this is going to be a great, great week. So, guys, have a good week. Enjoy the sports. Enjoy the rest of our shows. I hope you will join us Wednesday and Friday. But, guys, as always, no matter what you're doing, whether you're out on the town all around in third base, get home safe. <laughs>